Thank you. Good morning. I have to confess to start, uh, I didn't, I wasn't aware of something called the Apex Conference up till recently. Thank you to Ingo. I, I'm one of those people who, who use planes all the time, but I kind of turn up, I expect them to be there. I walk on, I'm, I'm the one stabbing the back of the seat, trying to make that respond to me, looking for the peanuts. And we share a little bit of that similarity with my core industry, uh, which is telecom. We kind of expect it to be there, and we kind of expect it to work, and we become dependent on it. And just, just kind of like out of interest, can we all just do a show of hands? Who has a mobile phone in the audience? If you can all just put your hands up. OK. All right, so let's try it. Who does not have a mobile phone in the audience? OK. Who has two mobile connected devices in the audience? So we're looking at about 160, 170% penetration. Who browses the web on their mobile device? Who does email on their mobile device? Who watches videos on their mobile device? Who manages their home on their mobile device? Wow, OK, now we're touching. Who manages their health on their mobile device? Wow, a, a true pioneer. How's that going? <laughs> very cool, very brilliant. Let's say I offer to take away your mobile device today. Could you survive? Well, this is a game we play with people, and anxiety attack happens. We actually have, in much smaller groups, we put a box in the middle of the room. And we say, can you put your mobile phone in the box? Some people just won't. Some people, but you, you, know, you persuade them, it's OK. Just put it in. It's not going anywhere. Then people just stare at it, just in case it might go on its own. And then someone comes in and takes the box away. And some people say, that's not funny anymore. Right? That's just kind of, that's insane. The reason I'm saying this is because what we've done in 15 years is re-engineer society to be dependent on something we didn't need before. And that's exactly what we're going to do again in the next 10 years. And we're going to speak about that together, because that's going to affect Ericsson, my core company, and all the companies around us here. And it's going to be a journey of exploration. It's going to be a journey where things that were strengths before become weaknesses in the future. And things that you didn't realize were valuable before become your biggest assets. We're going to talk about connectivity. And we're going to speak about what that means. It's something you can never see until it's not there, and then you realize it's missing. And we have to make sure as all businesses, that we are engineering connectivity into our foundational business plan. So I'm going to cover three things in this uh, presentation. Most people don't know who Ericsson is. We're invisible like connectivity. I want to make sure you understand who we are and what we do. I want to make sure you really understand what connectivity is, because it's invisible, but we need to understand it, because we're all dependent on it. And then I'm going to speak in the last part about what it means to our business models. What it means to us as companies going forward into the future. Some statements might sound dramatic, but predictably, it's going to be true. OK, so what is connectivity, really, and where did it come from? Connectivity is really the destruction of space and time. And it changes. Each time there's a wave and a revolution, it changes the performance levels and the types of services that are possible to actually deliver to customers. We started in 1876. Our foundational idea, and this is going to be a, a thought that we go through, all companies that are great start with a foundational idea. The challenge is to maintain that through the life of the company. 
Ericsson's foundation idea was that communication was a basic human need. It's not for the rich, it's not for the special, it's for everybody. That led to Stockholm having the most fixed telephone lines in the world in about the end of the 19th century. In 100 years, we connected about a billion places in real time. And that changed how companies actually did business. It changed how people related to each other. It changed how families lived. Everyone had a fixed line. We'd connected everything that needed connecting from a building point of view. So then we decided, about 1990, let's connect people. Connected now 5 billion people, only 7 billion people on the planet, right? 85% of the world's population is covered by mobile phone coverage. End of 2011, we actually had 6 billion. Changed people's lives. We're all living it here. You can't go home without it. You do not exist as a child in society if you don't have a mobile phone. Let's do another quick survey, just out of interest. Who has children? OK. Children. 14 years old that have a mobile phone. 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. Yeah, OK. I expect that to go down in the future. So we connected everybody. Oh, it's horrible. Oh, all my friends have a mobile phone. Kind of. Uh, now we're going to connect absolutely everything else. So we were connecting people, places, people, everything else. A plane is just a device on the end of a network. No different from any other device. Things inside the plane are just a thing at the end of a network. We have two sayings that we resonate around in the future that we believe will be true. The first one is that anything that benefits from a connection will have one. In the future, and already we're seeing today, things that are not connected start to feel a little bit stupid. And also, when one person is connected, their life changes. When everything is connected, our world changes. We see changes at a very high social level. Just give you some statistics, because these are things that are big. These are things that change the competitive landscape because of small, different companies doing different things to whether a country is competitive or not. 10% mobile broadband penetration in a country leads to 1% GDP growth. For every 1,000 broadband connections in a country generates 80 new jobs. And what we found, amazingly, is that speed is important. If you double the speed of the network, it leads to 0.3% sustainable GDP growth. 40% of the mobile traffic in the world today goes through Ericsson equipment. 50% of smartphone traffic goes through Ericsson equipment globally. So what should we connect, given that economic growth? Here is something called Sarah. It's a real problem in uh, dairy production, that cows, if they get their, their wrong pH levels in their stomach, produce uh, the wrong volumes of milk. Uh, so there's a company now connecting cows. They call them centennial cows. You don't have to connect the whole herds. You just have to connect indicators in the herd. Then in real time, keyword being real time, they know when the acidity is moving away, they have to change the feed, uh, uh, the feed levels, to actually stop Sarah actually happening. North America alone, the prediction is that this costs the dairy industry 500 million to a billion dollars a year. The interesting thing that we should all hold in our minds is when your competitor does this, then they are going to have a competitive advantage over you. 
What we see in industry, as, and we'll come back to this, is that somebody in an industry moves, and then the rest of the industry has to follow. So you have to choose whether to lead, follow very quickly, or die. We're at a, a very subtle inflection point as well, uh, in the sense that we all know we're going to have more connected devices. We have uh, we see them today. We have iPads. We have phones. We have more devices connected than we actually realize. Uh, that's very visible. The next wave that we're just tipping on that's really we're talking about here is where the, the connected devices get embedded inside industries. And then you get a 10x factor uh, of growth on those industries. And it leads to what we predict by 2020, there will be 50 billion connected devices all sensing inside the environment working together. Technical ingredients of connectivity. Let's just go through some highlights, because we always just say it's connected or it's not connected, and that's not exactly true. That's a very simplistic view, and it's very hard if you're going to foundation your business on that kind of level of understanding. First statement, very clearly, the world experiences connectivity through mobile, accelerating so into the future. As you can see here, there will be 5 billion mobile broadband users by 2015, compared to about a billion in fixed broadband. Most of the world's population will experience connectivity through a mobile phone device. They don't even know what the internet is through a fixed PC. So what kind of different aspects? Well, obviously, there's bandwidth. Some of the, and it, it goes from SMS all the way up to the most advanced countries which we are leading here with, with 4G LTE. Uh, so SMS, 160 characters, up to 4G LTE, that's about 12 meg down, about five meg up. The actual innovation is happening not because of bandwidth, but because of how you try and use the limited bandwidth. Some of the best innovations are happening actually in the developing countries. Timing. Does your connectivity happen now, or does it happen later? Does it have to happen now? Is it cheaper if it happens later? Is it cheaper if you cache it somewhere so that you can pick it up at a different time? Could be very important. When we're speaking about devices such as aircraft that are connected at certain points to higher bandwidth than other points, like when they're in the air. Does the connectivity have to be real time or can it be best effort? Real time meaning jitter. Any kind of real time communication has to have reliable throughput, both uplink and downlink. We had some great discussions and presentations, the importance of security. Do you know where your data is? Do you know who's looking at your data? Do you know if your data is the same as when you put it in there? Has anyone tampered with your data? Do you know if your data is the same as when you put it in there five years ago? Do you know where your data is? I know I, I believe if... Uh, my German friend Ingo, he found out that his data was in the US. He has a problem because we are all authorized to look at it because we have to make sure you're not a bad person, the Patriot Act. Very serious legal and regulatory aspects to the uh, question. And the last question that is the hardest question to answer, but the most valuable, why is my app slow? Why is my system not working very well? If my system goes down, then when it comes back up, has it got everything it really needs? Is it the same state as when it was before? If you can't answer that question quickly, it becomes a very big cost to business. So if you're building in the connectivity into your system, you have to be able to work those questions. So Ericsson's role. We call this vision a network society. And we're really taking the role of a business enabler, and we'll move into different examples of how businesses change because of it. We're building the networks, and you can see that we'll start working with different companies.
basically eight areas, communication services and the reinvention, mobile broadband, the fact that mobile broadband is really the last mile on fixed broadband is one network. We manage networks and services both for TV and media companies and for network operators. We do the business support and we do TV and media management on scale. Just a quick example of customers. The only reason I'm showing you this is because it's indicative of the changing landscape. If I'd shown this 30 years ago, there'd just be fixed network operators, telephone people on there. If I'd shown you this 15 years ago, there would have just been mobile operators on there. Now we start to see a few different people coming in. The ones that I'll just highlight, Mesh, Mesh Lines, biggest shipping uh, company in the world, is a direct customer of ours now. City of Johannesburg, direct customer of ours now. Okay, so everything, so we're going to move now into, uh, into the fun bit, which is the reinvention of business. And this is where Ericsson, everything I'm going to say to you is as big a challenge to Ericsson as it is to all of us as we move forward in the room. And if you actually Google this title, Changing the Game Before the Game Changes You, you'll pull down a document that actually gives much more data and description on on what we're going to speak about here. But fundamentally, we believe that every single successful company of the future will have con connectivity embedded inside its core DNA. And when that happens, the important boxes are shown here. Different experiences will be delivered that differentiate. Those experiences will be dependent on being able to manage real-time control of the performance of that. We see the most successful ecosystems, and we, we had great presentations again this morning, is when that experience is enabled to be actually complemented by others through platforms. If this, then that, added the whole experience and opportunity to Belkin without them really doing that much. Efficiency, which means that you're going to do it the cheapest you can possibly do it with the best performance. And in the middle, fundamentally, the biggest thing we need to understand is we're going into a software-led economy. And that means that you need to understand software business models. You probably don't realize, but Ericsson actually is the fifth largest software provider in the world. And you use our software more than you use anybody else's software each time you pick your device up, and uh, do whatever you do with your device. So connectivity is really just one aspect of the change. We're in a complete tsunami of uh, activity. Every, lots of things are coming together to create a rate of change that we have never experienced before as humans. There will be more change in the next 10 years than we have seen in the previous 100 years. So if you go back to how the world was in 1910, that's the effect that we should see in 10 years, which is why we as business people start to struggle with the disruption, because it starts to enter our normal business planning cycles. By 2025, it's predicted that one th a one $1,000 computer will have the same computational power as a human brain. What does that mean? It's predicted that by 2025, uh, sorry, 2045, a one $1,000 computer will have the same computational power as the entire human population. That's the actual progressive change. What we have at the moment is the most stupid we'll ever be in terms of devices, society, how we do things. And it's really hard to grasp sometimes because we think it's so advanced. It will never be this stupid again. This was a great quote. Your mobile phone has more computing power than all of NASA in 1969. NASA launched a man to the moon. We launch a bird into pigs. They are 
<laughs> the, uh, do you, know, do you know when you open up the birthday cards and it says, sings happy birthday to you and has a little chip in it that we throw away? That has more computing power than the Allied forces had when they landed in D -Day, on D-Day in France, for example. Devices, power is going through the roof, as we said from our friends with Intel. Uh, Back-end server capacity is uh, exponentially increasing, no barriers to entry, no cost. Took nine years for AOL took to get one million for users. Facebook. It took nine days for Draw Anywhere. One person now can run 10,000 servers in operation without a problem. Before, it used to be a one-to-one -one relationship. There are no barriers to entry for your competitors. There's no reasons why you should have barriers to entry to reinventing business models either. Big data, the other explosion. Every minute, 72 hours of YouTube, new video is uploaded to YouTube. In the next 48 hours, the equivalent of all the data ever produced in the history of the world will be produced, kind of like again. We have a massive explosion. The last one that's the most disruptive that we never really pick up on is dematerialization. It's the ability, actually, what we're really doing is taking the physical to the digital. And it's amazing what we are taking to the digital. Uh, and if you look at 3D printing, anyone who thinks they're manufacturing and they're safe, I, I saw that there's a 3D printer they're looking to print an aircraft wing now. Boeing was looking at that. I thought that was quite interesting. One area that is not solved and if you can solve it, you'll be the heroes of mankind. How many people have their, their mobile phones plugged in at the moment to external power because they're running out of power? Any, any people? Battery improvement is doubling about every 10 years. It's the only technology that's not staying in mate with, with what's going on. I, I was thinking I, this is completely free, free you know, Three thinking idea, but what do you have on planes? You have power. We actually have a solution with the electric car industry that allows people to pay for the power irrespective of the source. So if I'm in my electric car and I plug in somewhere, that electricity is actually billed to me, not to the person that's paying for it on that building. I'd pay for electricity probably in a plane, because uh, kind of that's something that I actually need. OK. If there's one message to go away with that I'd really like us to share, it's going to be off uh, this slide. And this comes to the disruption effects that we're actually experiencing. Every company that starts, that is successful, starts because of a brilliant idea. And they execute it really, really well. But then, they tend to forget what their brilliant idea was. Because what they become is a factory for machining the brilliant idea rather than the brilliant idea. And then when disruption comes along, you can't give up the machining, right? And the disruption destroys you. And examples, Kodak is the simplest one. Kodak's innovation was doing mass photography for all. To do that, they had to create film. That was the only way to do it in the industrial era. They became a film company. Well, they still were making film, even though they invented the uh, digital camera in 1972. They could not stop making film, despite the fact they all knew that nobody was buying film. So it's very, very important to understand, A, what your core business is, what your complements are, and how you can disrupt it. And we'll go into how Telco is trying to do that. We have the same problem. The, the number of examples that we have uh, in that area are endless. And we all laugh at them. Record companies, how silly could record companies be? Kind of, how couldn't they give it up? 
and then eventually they have to give it up. TV industry is, is going through the similar kind of thing at the moment. They're holding on to cable subscriptions, despite the fact that all of the user experience says we don't really want to do that. The moment somebody innovates a solution that meets the experience, then the change will happen, it will be on a cliff and it will die. So let's look at a couple of case studies of industries that are changing what we're doing. Uh, and these I've, I've chosen because they're also in the transportation sector. Insurance, car insurance, the most, uh, uh, what do you call it, conservative industry that you can imagine. 500 years hasn't changed. It's based on statistical knowledge uh, of return. Uh, until you, someone came up with uh, pay as you drive. Pay as you drive allows your insurance levels to be set by your performance in the car. Two million customers on this now. Uh, the prediction is by the end of the decade that will multiply by 50. It will lead to 50 billion euro premium insurance business. And you are in the insurance car insurance company, you either led this or you are quickly following this. Otherwise, you won't have a business. Because what happens inside your market is that all the safe drivers start doing this. And they get 50% less premium cost because they never have accidents. If you're not doing this, you're left with the junk. And you can't afford to do that, and you will go out of business. You will die. Another example, Mersh Glines. Biggest shipping fleet in the world. We're actually connecting 400 of their 500 ships in real time in the next two years, and we'll manage that operation for the next seven years. Why are they doing that? Because the value of that real-time information to them transforms their operational efficiency for their fleet. They can now, in real time, send back off each boat uh, current, wind, uh, What's the other aspect? Current, wind, uh, wave height. And they can adjust their trajectory across their whole fleet based on where those boats are going in real time. It takes about $100 million off just off fuel consumption in what they're doing. So the challenge is that if they can do that suddenly and you're not doing that, you have to find $100 million from somewhere else to be competitive all the time. Again, the shipping industry will go through the similar activity. The most stupid boat in the future will be a boat that's not connected. So to try and, and wrap up the, uh, the, the conversation, we in telecom have exactly the same problem. How do you destroy what is doing so well today before somebody else destroys it? And we are very similar as an industry we are all engineers that build mission-critical infrastructure that before we do anything, we plan and plan and plan, and we look at five years and 10 years and 15 years. This is actually the facility that I work out of in Palo Alto in Silicon Valley. It's called the AT&T Foundry. AT&T know that the growth curves are gonna come from disruptive companies doing what they do for cheaper and it's good enough, and it will become as good with time. So they've actually set up a different organization to disrupt their core business. This organization is not bound by the same rules as the traditional company. All they are are bound by the same rules as the new market. And they execute very quickly with very short projects and validate and prove that these other companies aren't doing anything special they're just choosing to do it. Very early days, you can go on online uh, to look at some of the innovations that are happening. Uh, we'll see if that journey actually is successful or not inside uh, AT&T. So I'm going to, to finish just with a, a closing message that what we're dealing with something, we're, we're dealing with something here that is not it's not minor in nature. This is something that is going to transform really how we do everything as people, as a business, as a society. 
it's such early days, we can't even see it yet. But the people who can start to ask the right questions are the ones that will see the opportunities and change how things actually work. And the great thing for the total world, and we call it the, the bottom line, for the first time, as companies, we can actually put solutions together that improve the performance and use of the world's resources and make economic profit for ourselves at the same time. And from that will become a new ecosystem of how we actually create society, business, and how we actually start to live that next journey. So on that note, thank you for uh, spending the time to listen to me, and uh, welcome to the Network Society. <laughs>